Hook, Line and Sinker by Teardrop Chapter 1 Read by Dark Crater We're so last! We're not lost. I'm telling you, Google Maps will tell us where to go. Just let me... We don't need Google Maps. Oh, come on, Lucas. In this brilliant era of technology, there's no reason to be driving through the country blind. Stop acting like an old man. The argument was made more chaotic as a lash of rain pelted against the SUV, harder than the others and giving the windscreen wipers a run for their money. The sound of the assaulting spring weather had been constant, but it was getting steadily worse the longer they drove, causing tensions in the car to run a bit high. There were four of them crammed together after all, and even considering the large space of the vehicle, they had been on the road for a large time and were wearing on each other's nerves. The driver, Lucas, stayed calm through it all. However, even as he reprimanded the worrying man in the passenger seat beside him, even his tone was quiet, in contrast to his biting words. If I'm an old man, then you're a stupid kid, he said, the man who was a head taller than him, and quite a bit broader. His hair was a darker shade of blonde than Lucas's, and spiked in the front. I know where I'm going, because I paid attention last time we were here. You were probably too busy staring at your screen the whole trip, like a nil back there. Don't lump me in with him, piped a fresh-faced youth in the back seat, without looking up from his laptop. I'm finishing an article, not melting my brains on Candy Crush. Hey, that game is badass, cried the front seat passenger whipping his golden head around to glare at the team. Have you ever tried playing against the Jelly Queen? She's harsh, man! What's another word for anomaly? Emil asked, pausing in his typing and acting like the other hadn't spoken at all. Try irregularity, Lucas suggested. Try annoying? Irregularity. Emil brushed his white blonde bangs out of his eyes, scratching his head as he considered. I haven't used that one yet. Okay, I, R, R, oh, it's bad enough, we're lost. Do we have to suffer through your writing too? Shut up, Matthias, you're whining again, Emil cut in. If I don't write, we don't get paid. Besides, if I want to relax at all this week, I need to type up our last case and post it on the blog before tomorrow morning. How can you even waste your time on such a boring one? Matthias droned, turning his face forward in his seat again. It's just a lingering spirit. No poltergeist, no ill will, no injuries, no screaming babies. Nothing to write about. Why don't you write up the Wailing Witch case? Posted it already. But that was less than a week ago. I write quickly, Emil shrugged. I'm cool that way. Well, while you're at it, maybe you could write us some directions. We're not lost. Lucas insisted warily. This road takes us straight to the cabin site. It's not that difficult to remember. We got off the highway, and now we're on this road for another hour. But you've been saying that for 20 minutes, and we're still in the middle of nowhere. It's not nowhere, Emil rebuffed. It's just too dark for you to see the coast. We'd have a great view from up here if it was daytime. He's right, said Lucas. Matthias opened his mouth to continue their abrasive back and forth, but their other, previously silent passenger intervened. A huge hand slid onto Matthias's shoulder from the man in the seat behind him, and a deep voice accompanied the action. He's going the right way. Don't distract him in this rain. Matthias shot a glare into the stern face of the huge blonde man, but backed off under the stare of his green-blue eyes, illuminated even behind his square glasses. He sunk down into his seat, mumbling under his breath. Nice, Bevel. You caged the beast, Emil said with a little grin, offering his hand palm up to the man beside him. Slip some skin. Bevel slid his large hand and fingers smoothly along the teams in an affirming gesture. It's so twenty years ago, Matthias grumbled, plucking out a thread on his sleeve and frowning back at them. It's still cool, Emil insisted. Right, Bear? 
Bervold made a deep hum of agreement, and held up a huge closed fist to a mill. The teen cracked a smile and wrapped his knuckles against the bigger man's, sending a cocky smirk Matthias' way. At least he used a social gesture from this decade, Matthias quipped at him. A fist bump is way more hip than slipping some skin. Who cares what's hip? Lucas questioned, his dark blue eyes still fixed on the road. Matthias, obviously, Emil fake whispered, while his fingers returned to flying over his keyboard. Bevold gave a tiny grunt that may have been a chuckle. That's why he plays Candy Crush. Bevold answered for him. Emil chuckled triumphantly. This guy gets it. Matthias growled, and once more turned away from his two companions, whipping out his phone to resume said king game. You're too soft for your size, Bevold, he whined. Always taking the brat's side. What do you mean? Emil asked his tone of exaggerated confusion. He's never on your side. Oh, ha, ha, Matthias said with a forced smile, ignoring them in favor of his game. For a few more minutes, the voices were replaced with just the click of Emil's typing over the roaring wind and rain. Bervold kept reading on his tablet, and Matthias played on his phone. Three passengers with faces lit up by their entertainment devices without which murders would probably ensue. Lucas usually popped in his earbuds and listened to his audiobooks when the car went quiet, but right now he needed to focus in this weather. Somewhere during the long silence, Lucas drew in a sharp breath, just audible over the rain. You okay, babe? Matthias asked absentmindedly, still playing his game. Lucas bit his lips softly and didn't answer. I got the other man to look up at him. You look a little... Matthias waggled his hand in the air in an indecisive motion. Lucas shook his head. I'm all right. Just thought I heard something strange. Sure it's not the memory of the Wailing Witch? Emil asked from the back, giving a mock wail low in his throat. Matthias made a disgusted sound. No, Lucas said slowly, as though concentrating. It's... Not like that. Want me to drive? Bervold asked. No, you already drove your part. The last half of the trip's my turn, Lucas reassured. It's nothing. Plus, we'd all like to get there sometime this year. I'm surprised we didn't all check into the geriatrics ward while waiting for you two to swap out. Emil actually laughed at Matthias' words. You do drive slowly, Bear, he agreed. Look who's giving a fist bump now, Matthias cheered, reaching around to present a nail with his knuckles. The team bumped his fist back with a grin. Boom! I just drive safely, Bevold stated simply, unaffected by their teasing. Oh, it's safe enough to put us all. Suddenly, Lucas slammed on the brakes. Everyone in the car lurched as it jolted, tilted, and finally stumbled to a stop off the side of the road. Panting breaths filled the air as adrenaline shot through their veins. What the hell, Lucas? Emil and Matthias said at nearly the same time, while Bervold simply grunted and rubbed at his head, which had been bumped on the back of Matthias' seat. He was the tallest out of all of them, and partially the reason they bought the SUV in favor of a general-sized car. Didn't you see that? Lucas asked urgently, staring wide-eyed in the rearview mirror. The other three men exchanged worried glances. See what? Matthias asked. Are you completely insane? Trying to give us all whiplash? Lucas shook his head empathetically, his breathing erratic now. There was an unsettled look about his face that they all recognized. Their focus narrowed sharply to Lucas waiting. There's something on the side of the road right back there. It, it looked like a person. They all felt the words, like invisible currents of energy that suddenly infused them with excitement and terror. Should I get the camera? Matthias asked eagerly a beat later. Instead of answering immediately, Lucas roughly maneuvered the car into a U-turn and settled it so that the headlights were shining back the way they had come. He put the SUV in park and snatched up his rain slicker from the space between his seat and Matthias's, pulling it on. Film if you must. He finally said, but whoever's out there, 
They desperately need our help. They knew by his tone that this was no joke. Lucas didn't get flustered very often, and when he did, they knew to take him seriously. Without another word, he climbed out of the car. The harsh glare of the headlights showed his slender body being pelted by the heavy rain as he began to search the side of the road. Following Lucas's example, Bervold slipped into his own coat. Emila Matthias followed suit. He's done crazier things, Matthias muttered. But isn't this a little random? Since when was our job on a predictable schedule? Emil asked, closing his laptop and sliding it beneath his seat. Stop hurting your brain trying to think and focus on the one redeeming quality you have. This is one of the tougher filming conditions. You up for it? Hell yes, Matthias replied at once, digging out his camera and fixing it with the proper settings. Low visibility, lots of rain, headlights in the dark against a murky forest, is the perfect setting for a spooky footage. Even if it turns out to be nothing, we can always use more creepy b-roll. A few seconds later, Matthias leapt fearlessly from the SUV, camera in hand, Bervold in a mill making a less dramatic exit. With a quick turn, Matthias had the camera fixed on himself, and he began speaking to it as rain poured over his hood. The sweet love of my life just about killed all of us, he blurted out, sounding victimized but intrigued. We were just driving up Lonely Road on our way to our annual Finland vacation spot when Lucas hits the brake and goes all cryptic, saying he saw something on the side of the road. He was acting weird a few minutes before, too. I think he sensed something but didn't tell us. Apparently, he thinks someone needs our help. As he explained the situation, he turned the camera to glance at Bervold and Emil in turn, as all three of them shuffled along in the blinding rain casting eerie shadows in the beams of light from the car. Lucas had to pause to wait for them a hundred yards or so away, and upon seeing the camera, called out loudly above the rain, If this is truly an emergency, you'd better be prepared to turn that off. You can't expect me to pass up an opportunity to film something like this off the clock. Matthias almost laughed back at him. There's three of you. You can handle it without me. You always can. Matt, I'm serious, Lucas said tersely, his words battling to be heard in the heavy rain. Matthias only made a dismissive sound. Calm down and give us some context here. What do you think you saw? Lucas gave an exasperated sigh and continued blazing the trail down the road. The others followed faithfully as they always did, looking to him for direction. I thought I saw a pair of arms coming out of the ditch on this side of the road. But before that, I felt an overwhelming sense of despair and pain. Like someone was crying out for help, but couldn't voice their plea. Whether he knew it or not, Lucas was slipping into drama speech mode without even realizing it. He was entirely sincere, but after doing what they had for so long, speaking so dramatically was commonplace when on camera. That's freaky, man. Matthias commented. Where Lucas and sometimes Emil would wax eloquent during filming, Matthias would digress to simpler statements, spoken with raw emotion. Bervold usually just looked stoic, and on the rare occasions that he would speak, he never said more than a few words. It was a good mix for the online audience that supported their lifestyle. I can't say how far down it might have been from here, Lucas said. The light from the car only goes so far, and the camera light isn't much better. Try shining it further that way. The second the faint beam of light added to the car's gleam on the hump of a ditch down the road a few hundred yards, something pale and humanoid caught the light, lying on the soaking grass. They all recoiled a few steps out of sheer reflex, and Matthias said a word that Lucas was scolding for saying in front of Emil. When he could focus the camera again, they edged forward, at a quicker pace now that the thing had been spotted. Dude, it's not moving, Matthias said in a low and shaking tone as they closed in. The figure they approached was lying face down with its two pale arms stretched over the ridge of the ditch, as though it had been trying to pull itself up and onto the road. The rest of the figure was obscured by a long curtain of sopping hair that looked gold in the harsh light. Despite the mane covering most of its body, however, it was obvious that it was naked. Hello? 
Lucas called bravely. I heard you cry out for help, didn't I? As he spoke, the figure lifted its head slowly, and through the long hair, two big, violet-blue eyes blinked at them. As they watched, one hand lifted towards them, and a pained groan escaped the figure. Don't just stand there, Lucas rebuked, boldling stridely forward to kneel beside the figure and take hold of its arms. Bevold, help me, please. It's a physical being. I don't know, man. It looks pretty pale and weird. Matthias noted in a fearful tone, as the larger man joined Lucas, standing over the figure. Lift around the waist, Lucas instructed, and Belvoir obeyed at once, latching his massive hands onto a small waist. A terrible scream escaped the figure, haunting and eerie enough to send shivers up all their spines. It was not as monstrous as many other sounds they'd heard over the years, but to their trained ears, it was unmistakably inhuman. Bervold nearly dropped the figure. The sound was so unexpected and so loud. He recovered and managed to haul the mystery being up to rest on the side of the road, directly in the beam of the headlights. Matthias had bolted back quite a few paces when the sound rang out, but he inched closer now, zooming the camera in and out to take in the details of the entire scene. Once upright, it was apparent that the figure was male, despite the ridiculously long golden hair, which hung down over his shoulders and pooled in his lap. He was completely naked, but for a curious bracelet around his wrist that looked to be made of large beads. He wasn't much bigger than a mill, but was slightly smaller than Lucas, and his skin was very white. He was whimpering and clutching at Beervold and Lucas as they kept him propped up into a sitting position. Once they looked down at the rest of his body, they could immediately see why he was in such distress. Oh, what... what the hell is that? Matthias asked. Speaking for all of them, they stared at the figure's legs. From his thighs to his mid-shins, his legs appeared functional, but his ankles were fused together. Where there should have been two individual feet, there was instead a long mass of what looked like gelatinous flesh that was covered in thin scales? Emil asked uncertainly. Are those scales? Get into the car, Lucas snapped sharply. Now, we need to dry him off right now. Bevold, help me carry him. Emil, dig out some towels from our bags. Go. The urgency and command in Lucas's voice caused them to respond without question. A mad scramble ensued in response as Emil ran back to the car and Bervold lifted the stranger with Lucas. He screamed again, a terrible high-pitched sound ringing clearly through the trees as they carried him back to the car. Meanwhile, Matthias was filming it all as he walked backwards in front of them. The longer they walked, the more erratic the cries became. Sometimes they faded into low moans, other times they swelled into loud wailing, but for all his noise, and for all his twisting in their arms, he was not actually fighting them. Matthias, put that camera down and help, Emil called over his shoulder. I can open the door, I can open the door, Matthias barked back, proving his usefulness by flinging open the side door. Over the back seat, they could see Emil rummaging through their bags, tugging out clothes and toiletries in pursuit of towels. Put him in the back seat, Lucas instructed, careful of his legs. They laid the stranger across the seat, trying to be cautious of the raw-looking lump at the end of his legs. His cries died down, but he still let out pained whines or grunts every other second. He's, um, he's got to be hurting. I mean, just look at that. Matthias sputtered, getting a better look at the alien-looking mass with the camera. God, what happened to you? The stranger seemed too preoccupied with his pain to hear the question, let alone respond. He lay there shaking, with his arms curled around himself, and didn't attempt to get up. A towel, Emil announced frantically, tossing the first one he found over the back seat, where Lucas caught it. He instantly began rubbing it over the stranger's knee and thighs. We have to get him as dry as possible, Lucas instructed succinctly. Beveled, prop him up. We need to get to the rest of him. Beveled went around the other side of the SUV, startling the stranger when he opened the door by his sopping golden head. 
Violet blue eyes looked startled as Bervor tugged him to sit upright and supported him against his chest. Incoming! Emil cried again, this time tossing the next towel he found to Beervold. He continued to search for more, while Lucas and Beervold began drying with what they had. The stranger didn't fight them, but he couldn't do much to help, as he was shaking so badly. His hair was the greatest challenge. It fell past his knees and was completely drenched. Every time they thought they had his chest or arms sufficiently dried, rivulets of rainwater would cascade down from his head. Emil, Lucas said, quietly impatient. I don't care if you use one of our shirts, but get up here and wrap his hair in something. Scrambling, the teen dug out one last towel to his luck and crawled over the mountain of bags to the back of the seat. From there, he carefully pulled the wet curtain of hair away from the stranger's face and draped it over the seat, letting it hang back into the trunk. He bound the golden length with their last towel and held it tight to drain. Once all that hair was out of the way, they could see that the stranger had a very youthful-looking face, pretty and round with a button nose, and big eyes fringed with dark lashes. However, his beauty was marred by the constant grimacing and agonized expressions. There's no way we have enough towels to get him completely dry, Matthias stated, from his prime filming position in the front passenger seat. The cabin has plenty, Lucas pointed out, rubbing at the stranger's torso and chest as clinically as possible. We'll take him with us. Not like we have a choice, Mill interjected. There's nothing else around here. Hospital, Bervold grunted, using the end of his sleeve to gently dry the stranger's face. He only blinked a little when a sleeve-clad thumb wiped around his eyes. Too far away, Lucas answered. It wouldn't help anyway. At that, they all found themselves silently staring down at the abnormality before them. Their guts twisted with the sight. It wasn't as though the flesh was bloody or mangled, but it was discoloured, and looking much darker than the rest of his pale skin, and glistening wet. There were mottled reds and pinks dotted within the pale whiteness of the flesh, and as Emil had instantly pointed out, there was a dark scale pattern underneath the layer of translucent film on the outside of the malformation. While patting him down, Lucas left that area alone, seeing enough to know that it would greatly hurt if he touched it. Once Lucas declared the stranger dry enough to stop, they wrapped him in the car quilt, the huge homemade thing that Lucas and Emil's mother had sewn for them two years ago. They had found that there was always a need for a blanket while on cases, and she had crafted them one specifically for the purpose, big enough to even wrap around Bervold or Matthias when necessary. After bundling the stranger carefully, so that his feet were untouched by the quilt, Lucas had Bervold sit behind him bobsled style against the car door to keep him upright. Despite Bervold's fear of the stranger protesting, he offered no resistance. All right, everyone, pile in. We're getting back on the road, Lucas announced. Matthias buckled himself back in. Lucas resumed his place in the driver's seat and Emil had to close the trunk from the inside and squeeze himself into the back with all their luggage. The team was not complaining, as he could stretch out over the backs. He still managed to pull his laptop from beneath the back seat and open it over his legs, beginning to type frantically. The scent of rain-soaked skin and hair filled the space now that the doors were closed, but it was too cold for it to be repulsive, and perhaps it was their imagination but there seemed to be a noticeable scent of salt wafting through the air as well. We have to hurry, Lucas said as he pulled back on the road, driving much faster than before. He needs to dry off entirely. He's cold, Bervold said, brushing a thumb down the stranger's cheek. His head was flopped back onto Bervold's broad shoulder, and the pale forehead was nudging his jaw, shaking really badly. He pulled the blanket tighter around the stranger, holding him closer against his body to try and keep him warm. In response, a slender hand reached up and grasped Bervold's sleeve with trembling fingers. Keep him as still and calm as you can, Lucas told him. That's easier said than done when you're driving like a madman, Matthias pointed out loudly, holding on as they rounded a curve. The stranger seemed to agree 
as he gasped and his eyes flew open with a flash of violet in response to the movement. He clutched frantically at Bervold, letting out a small chirrup of a sound. Stop yelling, Matthias, Lucas reprimanded in a quiet tone. We don't need to frighten him any more than we probably already have. But who is he, Lucas? What's up with his feet? Matthias turned the camera and focused it on the swollen gelatinous tissue, holding the base of his legs together on the seat. Well, if you could call them feet, what do you think happened to them? Matthias. The camera jerked a bit as Matthias looked up at Bervold, who was glaring at him sternly. Put the camera away. This isn't a case. It's an emergency. You shouldn't be filming right now. Matthias frowned right back at him. Bervold's protective claws had come out, as they always did once he had found something to care for, and Matthias generally knew not to test him when that happened. Once he had made a mill cry by teasing him a bit too far, and Bervold's sucker punched him so hard that he swore his great-grandfather's grandfather felt it for a week. Even Lucas had not been as quick to come to his brother's defense. Despite giving off an intense aura that turned people away, Bervold was a very nurturing person and demanded kindness for the ones he cared for. I think this instance will count as an emergency within a case, Lucas commented. That got everyone's attention. Our new charge isn't human. At least. Not entirely. Matthias can film if he wants. In fact, I think it's a good idea. Bevel glanced down at the pale slip of a man clinging to him and leaning its head on his shoulder. A small whimper left the mouth, and Bevel's brow furrowed. Can you tell us what happened to you? He asked the stranger very gently. Why you're out here? I wouldn't bother Bevel, said Lucas. If he is what I think he is, he won't be talking any time soon. I'm not even sure if he's capable of speech at all. What do you think he is? Matthias asked, turning the camera on to Lucas, capturing the intense look of concentration on his face. There was a silence in the car as they all waited for Lucas's answer. The only sounds were that of the rain as it continued to assault their vehicle and the stranger gasping. I think he must be a merman, 